My name's Susan McKinnon, and I'm a surgeon and I'm a scientist. I work at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. I'm going to talk to you tonight about innovation. Before I do that, I have a question. The question is, have any of you in the last day or two failed at anything? <laughs> My next question was going to be raise your hands. <laughs> so the answer was yes, a lot of people have failed. And let me say to those of you who have failed, even as recently as perhaps this morning or this afternoon, you are on to something great. In my career, there have been four things that have really stood out. Number one is hard work for a long time. Number two is failure. Identify it, embrace it, learn from it, but don't ignore it. Number three is you've got to work in a great place with great people who can coach you, mentor you, criticize you, and with whom you can collaborate. The fourth is something that is really very special, and that is that you will definitely have good luck. Serendipity will come your way. The most amazing things will happen to you, and you couldn't have planned them, thought about them, controlled for them in a thousand years. I'm going to talk about my pathway to strategies to improve the outcome for patients with terrible nerve injuries. And I'm also going to talk about what the experts say about expertise, about innovation, and about paradigm shifting. So first, what's a nerve? A nerve is those electrical wires that connect your muscles and your skin to your spinal cord and your brain, and they let you do basically everything that your body does. When they're injured, they can regenerate, they can recover, but the problem is they are so darn slow. By the time they reach where you want them to go, the muscles are frequently dead. If we look at this little cartoon and we imagine that the cell body or the control center for a nerve was the size of the Gateway Arch here in St. Louis, it would project its nerve fiber all the way to Anchorage, Alaska. If there was an injury at the Canadian-US border and you fixed it, repaired it, or grafted it, spliced it back together there, it would take two years to get the function up to Anchorage, Alaska. Imagine if it wasn't a muscle, but it was people, they would be dead. I started my career in the beginning of the 1980s, and it was just at the moment where there was a paradigm shift between repairing a nerve and grafting a nerve. A nerve repair, just bring the nerves together. The problem is it didn't work that well because there was damage usually on the end of the nerves. There was frequently bits that were lost. And so the paradigm shift was we can get a better result for these patients if we just splice the nerves together, a nerve graft. Problem is still a long way from the target muscle and the results were not that great. This is a, a picture of a patient of mine. I did a 20 some operation, took these hour operation, took these nerves, uh, spliced the nerves back together again, and then two or three years later, I took this picture, I was so proud, but if you could see the look on that young man's face, he's not so happy with the result. I didn't recognize that then because that was the standard for nerve grafting. So the thing that I've been passionate about and worked on for my entire career has allowed me to move my patients towards nerve transfer. And I'm going to talk about the how of the shift, but I'm going to tell you what the shift is. Back to that same kind of cartoon idea, you just go really close to where the muscle or the sensation is lost. And you look around and you take something from somewhere else and just move it close. And when you move it close, you get over that long distance problem. So you forget that there was a, an accident at the Canadian-US border. And you go straight to Fairbanks. And you say, people in Fairbanks, there are people starving in Anchorage. Could you spare us something? And they say, of course. And it immediately gets there, and the result is amazingly different. This is a young man who had exactly the same injury, but in the maybe five years ago, not two decades ago. And the result that he got is dramatic. One more example of um, nerve transfers, and this is stealing the idea of nerve transfers in patients with nerve injuries out in the arms and moving it to patients with quadriplegia in the spinal cord. 
So if you look at this injury, it's a typical injury. It's a C7 spine injury. They can move their shoulders, move their elbows. They cannot move their hands to do anything with their hands. Their fingers don't work. So if we look at the um, green nerves, which are connecting to the brain, and the red nerves that aren't, you just steal from a nearby green nerve that's expendable, and you move it to a nerve that will move your fingers. Just twist it over there. It sounds simple. And for somebody who knows how to do microneurosurgery, it is simple. <laughs> Here's a, uh, I didn't think that was so funny, but okay. <laughs> I don't know if you can see this, but let me tell you that this amazing gentleman, 70 years old when he came to see me, is a trauma surgeon. He was going to a trauma and he was hit by a car and he became the trauma victim and immediately quadriplegic. He could move his shoulder, he could move his elbow, but his hands are solid. They don't move a bit. He can't do anything. He's completely dependent on everybody for everything. He can't feed himself, drink water, write. Of course, he can't do that. But um, he had that operation, which I just showed you. A 10 centimeter incision or so in his arm, twist those nerves around, and here he is at a year, and at a year, I think you can see that he can hold that light ball, he can move it back and forth. That's not too impressive, but it's impressive for him. His whole quality of life changes. He can feed himself now, he can drink water, so his urinary tract infections are decreased, so less time in hospital. Um, it, it gives him um, a sense of an improved quality of life from an operation that would take about four hours skin to skin to do. A year later, not only can he do that, but he's become more vigorous, he's happier. His upper body movement in the shoulders and the elbow now can, are, are much better because they have something to do with the end of their extremities and um, a much happier uh, situation than before. Before he was injured, he actually climbed Mount Everest. After he was injured and had his nerve transfer, he wrote his book and he signed his book Handwriting, much like my handwriting, actually. Um, so how did I get there? How, what was the transition to go from the nerve grafting to nerve transfers? Two parts, and the one is the clinical part. Training a surgeon is still, no matter what anybody says, no matter how techy you're gonna get, it's one person to one person to one person. It's very much an apprentice. And these are the giants in those different paradigms that we've talked about. These two giants, Alan Hudson and James Murray, what fortune I had. They both taught me when I was students, and then I worked with both of them at the University of Toronto for 10 years, giants in nerve grafting, giants in tendon transfers, and you merge those two areas together and you get nerve transfers. And not only that, but those failures, those bad results on the nerve grafting were the stimulus to go ahead and try something different, permission to do something different and get out of the box. Research as well, I could not have taken those ideas to a clinical patient population without being able to have dense research for a long time. I went to the lab first when I was 28, 1978, and I started working on a better nerve graft. That was the paradigm then. A decade and a half later, a lot of research, not such a great result, but out of that poor results came a lot of techniques in the laboratory to basically look at every aspect of function that you could imagine in nerve reconstruction, including uh, things like transgenic models where we can label the nerves so they fluoresce green, so we can see them moving around, and we can test whether these nerve transfers are gonna work before we take them to the clinical population. Another area took six years with this little idea. We were told in the 80s, you cannot touch a nerve, you can't go inside a nerve. If you go inside a nerve, you're gonna damage it. And once you get in there, you're not gonna understand it anyway. It's just gonna be all jumbled. Well, guess what? You can go inside a nerve and it, you're not damaging it. And when you get in there, oh my gosh, it is like Alice in Wonderland. You cannot believe what you're seeing. Seriously, like amazing, inside the nerve. A bundle over here, you stimulate it and the thumb extends. You can be up in the arm and you stimulate it and the thumb extends. You can be down in the arm and stimulating and the thumb moves in one direction. The anatomy is amazing. And you know what, we shouldn't be shocked by that, should we? But those two things together came for me for my paradigm shift. But so what about my paradigm shift? Every one of you in the audience today is only here because you are after something fabulous too. Let's talk about what the experts say about who does it, who are the experts, what they need to do it, where they need to do it, and what'll happen. 
when the paradigm shift happens. So these are the experts I'm going to draw from today. Anders Ericsson gave us the whole idea of the 10,000 hours. The whole idea of you have to work a lot forever. He gave us two other things. You have to take risks. You have to be able to fail. You also have to be able to listen to your coaches. You have to take criticism. Dave Logan, where should you work? He talked about five stages and said, you've got to find a stage four. Well, here are the five stages. Nothing very creative is going to come in a stage one. It's like gang warfare. <laughs> nothing much is going to happen when you're standing in line forever and nothing's happening. That's a stage two. Most workplaces are stage three. That's very typical of a department of surgery. <laughs> I'm the dean, you're not the dean. And those are good for lots of things, but where creativity happens is in a stage four. This is a picture of our uh, lab group working together. We're actually drawing on the blackboard there, or the whiteboard, a new idea for a different type of nerve transfer. These uh, stage fours, everybody's equal. It's a, your safe place. You can make mistakes. You can admit your failures. You can talk and learn from each other. Stage five would be something we should all aspire to. And um, uh, today, Nelson, Nelson Mandela passed away. <sighs> but should aspire to that. 18 minutes. OK. Uh, Steve Johnson wrote this book on, in 2011, so just recently, he wrote this book on where good ideas come from. And he talked about what you need to make a paradigm shift. You need to be able to fail. You need to spend a long time doing it. I want, I want, I now, I now. That's not going to happen. You have to take your time and be prepared to go slow with it. Acceptation, take an idea that somebody else has got. Serendipity. He called this whole thing together having the adjacent possibility. You may have an idea, but if you don't have the things around it, if you can't get ideas from here and there, if you're not working in a good environment, it's an idea way before it's time. It's not going to jump. Thomas Kuhn, 50 years ago, this year, he wrote this incredible book about what happens in science and medicine when paradigms shift. And they don't go slow. They don't go linear. They jump. You can see at the bottom, I've got these stairs. Nerve repair, nerve graft, nerve transfers. This book tells you what happens when you are going to make a paradigm shift. And guess what? It is not nice. It's controversial. People are mean to you. They beat you up. They're really horrible. In the 90s, I started to go to our national meeting to present my work. And I would come back, and my husband would say, why do you keep going to that meeting? You always come back crying. I'm older now, I don't come back crying, but seriously, every time I go to that meeting, I come back upset. Why do I keep going to that meeting? I know why I go to that meeting. I am so darn passionate about nerve injuries. These are the people that are looking after the patients with the problems that I want to fix in my lifetime. So I would add to all those things those experts tell you, I would add that word passion. But did you know that it comes from the Latin word passio? And did you know that means suffering and enduring? <laughs> Why don't they tell us that at the beginning? <laughs> it would make so much more sense. It would be so much easier. And I say, yes, I came back crying. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> I'm going to stop with uh, a quote from, oh, that's the end. It was a great quote. <laughs> OK, I got to tell you the quote. We'll talk quickly. Um, in 1849, there was a book written, um, and it was by John Ruskin, and he said, for your life, this is what you have to do to have a good life, you have to work hard for bread, food and water, roof above your head, and you have to work hard for your heart. And of those two things, the most important thing is find what your heart is in. And he also said that the key to a complete life and a happy life and a productive life is know what you have to do. Not what you want to do, not what someone told you to do, not what you should do, but what you have to do. You might not make as much money, it might be harder, but you know what you have to do, and then when you know what you have to do, do it. 
That's an easy, that's an easy thing to know. For those of you that haven't found yet what you have to do, keep looking for it. Be, be 80 years old. Keep looking for it. And when you do, you know what you have to do? Just do it. Thank you all very much, but... I'm on my 18 minutes, so... Well, my shout-out was to Andrew Yee, and if they hadn't applauded, Andrew, because you did such a darn good job, I would have said that Andrew Yee's my partner, my collaborator. He's 26 years old, and he made this great Prezi. And he's definitely... He's definitely on his way to find his passion, and I wish him all the best in his suffering and enduring. Thank you. Oh, yeah.